cost and feasibility of implementing a national alternative roadway funding system, a national <coughs> including the technology of going cars and anything else that requires. Options for deployment and operation of the system, including potential private operators, public operators, and so on and so forth. Collection and enforcement mechanisms. They even require protection of privacy and data security. Cyber security is even brought up. If everybody winds up with devices in their cars and we're going to get all this information out of privacy, and as importantly, how do we protect other countries from hacking into the system and, and stealing information and having cars drive off the road or <coughs> And the structure of implementing the national <coughs> Now it really is interesting. We have to evaluate the impacts of the system on transportation revenues. This is all in the bill. On personal mobility and on freight movement and costs. It must evaluate integration of the national system with state-based revenue systems. In other words, they're doing exactly what they should do. They're recognizing the need to have a national framework that the different states can tap into. It's very difficult for the state of Florida, for example, to implement a mileage-based user fee when you know a third of cars, especially in this state, are coming from out of state to go to Disney. You know, so how do you do this? They're really talking about having a national program that could be designed specifically so states could tap into. They don't have to. They can keep the gas tax, but if they want to choose into it, they, people would use the same devices in their car, the same accounts, the same pain. Toll revenue collection. I was shocked to see this. In the actual bill, it mandates that this research that designed this system must accommodate the collection of tolls, which is pretty, pretty cool. Because I've been talking for years at IPPTA about the toll industry needs to be at the table. Congress just agreed, said the toll industry needs to be at the table. The PNC fee collection, the fair collection, over lift. You see the transition away from private and home vehicles. All this is addressed in the bill. And any other relevant transportation revenue mechanism. Should we design this so we could also use it for parking and different things like that? This is it. Federal system funding alternative advisory board. We'll We'll have oversight on this, on the development of this new way of collecting money, national road pricing system. It must include representatives from state DOTs like that, local and regional transportation agencies like, like SANDAC, that Sam Johnson just came into the room, used to work in, that was the first to develop managed lanes and, 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 and uh, dynamic pricing. Past pilot entries from the fast section and oh, Toll facility operators. This bill actually requires the toll industry to be on that advisory board to protect the interests of the toll industry and fleet operators to representing heavy vehicle <coughs> Key point tolling will be an important component of the new national system, and the tolling industry must be represented. So, how will all this affect tolling here in Florida? That we're all going to talk about after we hear from our friend Bob. Okay, so Bob is going to come up here next to me. You know Bob who will direct the transportation policy and the Sorrel Freedom Trust Transportation Fellow of Reasons Foundation. The only part I really want to read out of this is the sense that he did advise the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Transit Administration. White House Office of Policy Development, National Economic Council, Government Accountability Office, and State DOT in numerous states. So Bob, you feel like maybe you're going to start a neighbor. So Bob, welcome. <laughs> CHRP did a synthesis report that came out, uh, I think, last 
year. Uh, and they, uh, they synthesized results from dozens of business and public opinion surveys on the subject and found the average level of support was 24%. Most people think it was a bad idea. Uh, and part of this, I think, the media has uh, given the portrayal of this as big brother in your car. The government's going to be monitoring everywhere you go and blah, blah, blah. And you have to do this in order to make this work. This is what people believe. Um, there's also, and I've seen already in California, uh, I'll say it in this group, right-wing populist attacks on the potential of the transition to what they call a BMT tax as yet another tax on right. They don't, they don't believe for a moment that it would be anything other than a big addition on top of the gas tax, uh, rather than a replacement as the advocacy is all within. So there's big problems here. Also, I think state DOTs and others in the transportation community have emphasized revenue increase. We need all this new revenue. We need all this revenue. And the, you talk to people, average people about revenue, and they think, grab my wallet because they're going to come after me. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff out there that if we're going to do this, it has to be overcome in some way. It's not going to happen next year or, or, or very soon. Um, so, oh, and also, I, I go to I, TRB annual meetings. I've sat in on a lot of sessions on, on uh, going to per mile sort of thing. Wouldn't believe what's going on in universities. Graduate students, professors looking at this. Oh, finally, this is a way we can make those awful drivers pay the full cost of everything. And so I've seen papers that come out with a fee per, per mile driven of like 80, 90 cents because it includes this little bit over here to pay for the roads and all of these other externality charges they want to build into this. I mean, that's what a lot of the academic community sees this as, as a giant tax, not a revenue neutral thing. Uh, that doesn't mean that's what Congress believes, but that's what, that's the academic, a lot of the academic community is saying. So we've got a great problem here. This is, this is the older version of Ed's chart. You just emailed me the new one yesterday. I didn't have time to put it in the uh, presentation, but I'll be putting it on. I'm using this in a lot of presentations on various subjects. Everybody needs to get up to speed. Yeah, so we're not really out of this, Now, so what I think, given, given these, all these problems, where we are today, I think we should try to reframe the concept uh, to make it more of a good thing for, for the people who are going to be making this transition. Uh, and I think we need to create a genuine value problem that you're going to be better off when this happens than you are in the future, than, than the status quo future. And I think it might be wise to, be, to start the transition off with not necessarily solving the revenue problem, which means people grab for their wallets, but solving some other problem that is more obvious that they can, they can see, oh yeah, we really need to make a change because of this problem. And so let me explain what I think that is. So first of all, the first part of the value proposition, when you think about, you know, Ed mentioned 100 years of, of the fuel tax, invented in Oregon, interestingly enough, in 1919, and within 10 years, every state had a per gallon fuel tax as a pure user fee. And in most states, either legislation or a constitutional provision said, this money is generated from highway users and needs to be spent entirely to benefit highway users. That's a user fee. But um, it, you know now that the federal tax, about uh, between 20 and, and 30%, Get spent on non-highway, depending on how you slice it, you know, how you what you find things as. The average state diverts uh, between 10 and 20 percent of the state fuel taxes to non-highway uses. Now they're all trans almost all transportation, things. but to the average uh, voter, they say, well, this is no longer a user fee, as as we like to call it in the transportation business. It's a tax, and they see it when the proposal comes up uh, to increase the state gas tax. They say, well, this is a tax increase. All these taxpayer groups that I sometimes am friends with uh, say, oh, no, we've got to fight this because it's a tax increase. They don't at all appreciate it as a user fee. They wouldn't do this about uh, a needed increase in, in rate of charge for cell phones because they need to put in more towers, or a needed increase, we need to have another electricity plant because we're going to have blackouts if we don't, and the electric bills are going to go up. Well, OK, it's a user fee. We know it's going to benefit us. But they don't believe that about gas tax. So, I think we should need to fix that it's not at the gasoline tax increasingly will be not applicable to all vehicles, so some people won't pay. 
Uh, it's not keeping pace with the growth we need. Some people don't understand that, but we know it's true. It's not transparent. You saw that collaboration of things uh, that just make up what like California, I mean, the Florida gasoline tax. Uh, so people have no idea what, what's really being collected and, and how much they're paying. There's no effect on congestion, which uh, tolls, we know, because we've seen express lanes uh, and have a, a health resolve congestion. It's not fully dedicated to the benefits of the people who pay. So it's, it's really a tax and not a user fee in, in practical terms for people. Uh, there's actually a whole legal history of the difference that's been fought out in state courts and to some extent federal level between a tax and a fee. And I think if, if we want to try to make this a real user fee, we should not call it a vehicle miles tax. We should call it a mileage based user fee and then try to work to make sure it actually is a user fee. And, uh, and that is, that's a question that we probably all need to debate and think about. But I think the winning side is going to be if we make it as much as possible a real user fee uh, that people will accept like they accept their phone bill or their electricity bill or their water bill and so forth. That other thing is to make it really customer friendly. Uh, it's simple and understandable. It's not a charge for, for air pollution. It's not a charge for uh, uh, this and that and other thing. It's simply a charge to pay for the cost of roads. To build them, to operate them, to maintain them. It's to replace the fuel tax guaranteed not to add to it. It should be fair to all road users. Everybody who takes up space and does wear and tear is going to pay it. It should be transparent. You know exactly what it is, who you're paying it to, and what it goes for. Uh, you should be required, uh, your system in your vehicle should report only miles, and presumably which jurisdiction uh, they were, they were it, but not all kinds of other details. Privacy protections, as I mentioned, and accountability to uh, road providers, they're going to be getting the money. Uh, you should know who they are and, and, uh, and what you pay to whom. Now, the big question, and here Ed and I uh, are on a little different uh, uh, approaches. Should it be a state-led transition or should it be a federal government? Bottom up or a top down? It's a big question. And, and uh, uh, Mike, the arguments I give for a state-led transition are, first of all, the states own and operate the roads. It's their responsibility. They're properly funded and maintained. <laughs> states are demonstrably more credible on, on highway funding than Congress. I mean, Congress hasn't increased any fuel tax since 1993. Most states have had one or two increases in fuel tax since then. They've been able to persuade voters that they will deliver value uh, in exchange for it. People don't believe that in Congress. They simply don't. States, of course, we know are the laboratories of democracy. Uh, states, as I had a fuel tax of uh, 35 before, years before the feds had a dedicated fuel tax. And the demonstration of that, uh, a few leading edge states that actually do this and solve the problems of public acceptance can show the way for, for other states to do it. Uh, so that's that's my case for, for the state led transition. Now, there are some cases that have made ensuring nationwide operability. Uh, providing a political cover for state officials to say, well, the feds are doing this and, and you can simply add on and be more fair. Economies of scale for making the equipment, all that's true, uh, and fixing the, the, the highway trust fund. So it's a question of there's points on both sides. And, and uh, I mean, I see those are our real factors, but I still think it should be started uh, by <coughs> empowering states to, uh, to fight the bull and actually do it. And, uh, uh, Here's my other argument against the, the federal vote. Given the, the uh, lack of confidence in, of, of the voting public in Congress, and the lack of trust that what they're going to do is really for, for public benefit, I think trying to force a, a top-down approach uh, could set back the whole transition that we need to make. Uh, uh, I can just imagine the kind of populist and, and anti-tax groups that could, uh, could really get mobilized and do large-scale campaigns against Big Brother uh, and, and not to let this, this be imposed from the top down. The trucking industry uh, is, is a big potential opponent. Uh, there have been several proposals made. Uh, one is just a study looking at the pros and cons from the, I think it was the Congressional Budget Office, uh, on, uh, starting with trucks as an easy way to do this, to start the transition at the federal level. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that is asking for war. 
uh, that we don't really want to have. I think the trucking industry can be brought along if it's a genuine value proposition for them. Uh, but that's that's a case by case uh, thing. And the last thing I want to see is real serious politicization of biodiversity issues. These already are not popular. They only have less than a quarter of support. So the more compelling problem that I think we could use to start the transition is the need to uh, uh, revitalize, rebuild, basically, and modernize the interstate highway system. That's something everybody can be, they don't know yet that it's in as bad shape as it is, but they can be, I think, shown that it is, shown what it's going to cost, and that the existing funding system is not set up to do this job. Uh, and it, uh, the limited access system of which the interstates are a part is about 35% of all vehicle miles of travel. If we can convert that part of the system, which I think would be the easiest part to convert, using today's technology without a new, a new technology boxing part, um, it would be a, big, a giant step, a giant first step in any given state toward the rest of the transition that will have to come after that. Tolls can easily, electronic tolls can easily be reformulated and stay there on a per mile basis. We already have the technology. Uh, we have phones, your smartphone can do the toll also. So uh, this this report from the this was asked for in the FAST Act. Uh, Congress mandated that TRB be an expert committee to study the future of the interstate system. That's the report that came out in December of 2018, and it basically said the pavement is wearing out, the system's old. There's numerous bottleneck interchanges like Golden Blaze in Miami that that are of my existence uh, that that need to be basically. Not dynamite, but replaced, redesigned for today's and tomorrow's levels of traffic and, and rebuilt. There's not enough lanes and a number of interstate corridors for even today's traffic, let alone the projected growth, even at the 1% of the year BMT growth. And there's no dedicated truck lanes. There's increasingly a case for dedicated truck lanes as we look at, at the tuning and autonomous trucks. And there's no services. Uh, uh, at, uh, that, well, the last point was not in the TRB. All the other points were in the TRB. That's by the way. Uh, there's no services at interstate rest areas where there should be full service plazas, including uh, electric recharging and all that sort of stuff. So, this is the recent foundation report that came out uh, last spring as a response to the TRB report that said we really could do this uh, as a toll finance uh, endeavor, state by state, and it could solve the two problems at once. It could start the transition to per mile charging. Uh, on the easiest part of the system to do that with, and it could, could get the interstate to be built uh, uh, in a way that, that needs to be done. Now, <clears throat> we said, we proposed in that a, uh, a bill that could be, or a provision that could be part of the next reauthorization. That would be, uh, that would say that any state that wants to do this, i.e. to rebuild their interstates with toll financing and make the tolls a per mile of uh, uh, user fees, Place the gas tax. Uh, would, would get permission, exemption from the 1956 prohibition, if they agree to six <laughs> provisions that are designed to make it customer friendly and serve the public interest. Number one, the tolls have to go all electronic and charge per mile. Okay, that's easy. Charge instead of the fuel tax, not in addition. So any corridor that was rebuilt with toll financing would give rebates on the state uh, gasoline diesel tax, which is usually done with electronic toll rate, and they're already doing it. New York Thruway, best pass is doing it for, for truck fleets that's correct. The revenues could be used only for the capital operating costs or the true user fee. You charge, you start charging tolls on a corridor or a bridge after all the work is done and you open it to traffic. So people are only paying once you get riding on a better road than they had before. You're not paying this, they're not paying to sit through their way through construction for four years. Uh, so it's a value proposition. You charge all vehicles, you don't single out trucks. And this is controversial with states, but you charge the same rates to in-state and out-of-state vehicles on the basic fairness and the interstate commerce clause. States should not be discriminated against out-of-state people in interstate travel and commerce. And I think Congress would actually like that. A lot of states wouldn't. They want to put this whole thing at the border. So what about other roads? Uh, yeah, again, I said this would be starting with the limited access system would be an easy way to get started and done state by state have the demonstration effect and so forth. Uh, and then once the state had gotten underway and people were starting to see, yeah, they were serious. We're really not having to pay twice. It's really a replacement on the border where it's implemented. 
then they have a good basis to start planning to transition to other, uh, uh, other roads and streets in the state. And this would be, from all the things that we've done, research that people have done, a lower per mile rate. You're probably going to need about maybe four cents a mile for cars on to redo the interstates, but about two cents a mile to do all the other uh, roads. So it makes sense to be able to have two different rates within the state, uh, not the same rate uh, for all roads. Um, you want to be sure that the, that the high level facilities are, are adequately funded and, and maintained. Um, State DOT would be the responsible party for anything that's now considered a state highway, and certainly Florida, major arterials and urban areas are state highways, and they should remain the state's responsibility because they're vital for, for through travel and so forth. And uh, they're potentially subject to restrictions and lane drops and road diets and things if the, if the cities have control of them. Uh, and then the, the local county local agency would be responsible for the local roads. <coughs> And uh, this is a, I use statistics from the Federal Highway Administration. How much BMT in a typical state uh, is in each category? Limited access works out about 34 and a half percent of state and state highways. Highways with state numbers and federal highway numbers, other than interstates, about 43 percent. And the rest of the BMT, about 22 percent, is local streets and roads. Uh, that would be the, the local level responsibility. And our, uh, scheme that I outlined in a paper that, that, that is a separate paper from the one I showed you uh, calls for uh, annually basically adding up the BMT for each type of roads and that would be the amount of money uh, from the fees that, that is allocated to limited access <coughs> provider, state DOT, and uh, local agencies that are responsible for roads. And uh, this way people would see uh, they know who the provider is of each kind of road obviously over regulatory uh, uh, oversight of spending by state state transportation commission and, and local equivalents. And the transparency and accountability in the form of a roadway user bill. And uh, uh, you can't probably see the details of this, but it lists the three categories and says that uh, um, the, the state would collect directly for the county and the state uh, roads, the uh, county local roads, and various limited access providers, toll agencies, and, uh, and investor-owned uh, P3 companies would be directly collecting for the others. So the bill would itemize all of it, but would only be sending the bill for the ones for the uh, uh, state.